of you who are potentially joining for the first time, I wanted to let you know also that this is a series that we're running every single Thursday at 5.30 Berlin time. So this exact time. And every single week, we're trying to cover one aspect of how marketing can and should and is changing toward greater focus on sustainability and ethics and purpose. Because really what all of us here have in common is that we really want to use these tools for good and help companies that actually want to make a real change happen to make that possible with the tools of marketing and branding. Um, so I know that all of you have like some really rich experience and that's why these sessions are also very interactive. So at any point, if you have a perspective on what Mo is saying or what we are discussing and you even might have a question related to your direct working life experience at the moment or whatever it might be, you're super welcome to just unmute and jump into the conversation. Or of course, that's always an option to just put it in the chat. But basically we want this session to be for you and it's, it's really all about that. Um, I'm Ida, I'm the founder of Becoming and we are a change marketing agency. So that's exactly what it's about. It's using the tools of marketing and branding to help purpose-driven startups reach the next level of impact. Um, and we share that mission very excitingly with uh, Mo, who's coming from Zebra Growth, another ethical growth marketing agency who specifically wants to do exactly that as well, like help startups grow with the most sort of growth oriented tools for marketing, but to do that with ethics at the core of it. So I'm really excited for tonight's topic and to kind of figure out what that really means um, in practice. So Mo, um, yeah, as I said, he's the founder of Zebra Growth. You're also a founding member of Zebras United, and I'm sure many of us are already a member of that community as well. Um, I know that you have a particular background in sustainable food and drink, which is going to be interesting to see if that has any impact on, on your mind and your thoughts today. Uh, and you also studied business, but I know that you kind of picked a different path from there. So maybe as a start, can you just tell us what made you so enthusiastic and engaged in this whole concept of growth marketing to begin with? Um, sure. Uh, thank you so much for having me, first of all. It's a pleasure to be here. And Welcome everyone, lovely to see everyone's faces and to see people join. Um, so I think the question was what got me into growth hacking and actually what got me into growth hacking is probably not what got, in, what got me into um, ethics and social impact in general as well. So those are kind of two parallels in my life that I have decided to combine um, through Zebra Growth. Um, but what got me into growth hacking is uh, my background in digital marketing and advertising. So. Uh, as you mentioned, Ida, I studied business management uh, with marketing, actually, so the focus on marketing. Um, before I studied that, I actually uh, did a marketing kind of course um, during my gap year, if you'd like. Um, and I started freelancing uh, in digital marketing extremely young. So I was like 17 when I got my first project. Um, and that helped me, like I said, kind of test out the waters in the digital marketing space. I went from kind of content creation to a bit of kind of uh, website development to then move into online advertising. Um, finally, I then also moved into kind of corporate venture building. And uh, throughout my kind of career so far, I've worked primarily with or for startups. So the corporate venture builder maybe was not directly a startup, but at the same time, uh, we kind of created startups um, for bigger corporates. And yeah, that's that's kind of what made me interested in the growth hacking space. Yeah, that's like quite a journey. And it's also great that you've had so many different angles on the whole marketing topic and the business experience in general. Um, so maybe then also a good place to start to put us all on the same page. Within Zebra Growth, you literally have it in the name, um, but how have you defined growth? I'm sure, so have it in the name. Uh, the name actually got inspiration from Zebras Unite, uh, which is a global community, um, founding led community of basically founders who see business as a force of good, um, who kind of want to go against the whole uh, uni uh, unicorn uh, mentality, which sadly I actually have a unicorn cup here, but I didn't want to show it because it's very off brand, <laughs> but we're, we're, we're against the unicorn model. And um, that's, like I said, we took inspiration from the Zebras Unite movement. Uh, shortly after we founded the company, we, we then actually joined that movement. So how I see business or the future of business um, to kind of run its course is to be one of the core elements of transforming our society into better, right? Um, 
a zebra is usually a company or a startup that's not necessarily aiming to to exit with a billion dollar valuation, but it's more trying to support as many people around the globe as possible. Um, it's focused on regenerating. It's focused on um, creating the maximum impact, if you'd like, rather than on profit or shareholder maximization. So that's the kind of a bigger, higher level, if you'd like, introduction to what a zebra is compared to what a traditional unicorn is. Mm -hmm. It also actually reminds me of a conference uh, way, way back, an Ashoka conference I went to where we had a whole session on the difference between scaling up and scaling deep. That if you really want to have an impact, it's actually not only, for example, launching a product in a certain area, but it's also thinking about how that product is going to have a sustainable impact on people there, how it's going to, you know, stick around, retention, all of these other types of questions. So now that you're focusing your entire methodology around growth marketing, have you then also started to redefine what the goals should be of growth marketing? Um, definitely. So maybe just a quick uh, overview and context of what growth marketing is, right? Uh, if you compare traditional digital marketing or marketing in, in general with growth growth marketing, also known as growth hacking. Um, it's just trying to take a much more experimental uh, and hypothesis-led approach of how you run your marketing function, right? So I guess the first rule is, if you have any assumptions, if you think you know what you're doing as a marketing manager, then you're doing it wrong. <laughs> you should bend those assumptions and feel like, actually, there's so much to try to learn in, in kind of the journey of marketing your brand or business. Um, and that's, like I said, the biggest differentiator. The, the second biggest differentiator is also trying to understand how you can create organic network effects and virality loops within your whole customer journey, uh, within the marketing function again. So it's trying to understand how can I not just increase the amount of users that I acquire, but how can that help me acquire even more users after that within the ethical context, meaning then how can that become a scalable model for your social impact, right? Um, Sorry, I forgot what your original question actually was. <laughs> yeah, well, if the kind of objectives of growth marketing is also sure. changing once you put the ethical lens on it, or if it's more just, for example, a different type of company, a different type of product, or does it actually change the goals of growth mm -hmm. marketing? Yeah, so uh, it, starts, it starts with your core business. Um, I see marketing as one of the biggest areas or functions of a business. You can, in my eyes, and this is a very big debatable issue between business leaders, between marketing leaders, but uh, I see business as a loose kind of end, uh, you know, cloud, if you'd like, on, uh, on how to achieve your specific goals, right? It's a, it's a way of managing people, creating technology and using tools to achieve goals. Now, when I say it starts with your core business model, it means what is your actual, tr you know, goal for your business? And that biggest function with your business then supports the growth and communication of that, right? So the biggest differentiator and how we flip around growth hacking or growth marketing is to say our end goal is social impact. And we really work with clients closely to help them define some kind of metrics to try to understand how are they actually improving their social impact over time. Um, so that means, you know, not just looking at revenue, even the revenue is part of the mix, not just looking at profitability, again, profitability, because we're working with profit uh, kind of oriented as well businesses or businesses that are making profits, so not NGOs, um, it's still part of your metrics, but your core North Star, if you'd like, is focused on the deep rooted kind of purpose of your organization or brand. So mm -hmm. if you don't understand your purpose as a brand, we probably won't be supporting you to, to help you grow. Um, if you need help with that, we also do support with that because we do branding as well as, as growth hacking um, and we combine those two, but it's pinpointing your core reason of being, right? Why does your brand or business exist from a social or environmental context? Once that is defined, then we help communicate that. And then we try to understand how can we start to really analyze and kind of measure the increase, incremental or sometimes even leaps of increase in that performance. So when we talk about performance, when we talk about success, uh, we're not talking about how rich you're getting, but it's, it's focused on how you can be able to grow that long-term social and environmental impact that you're trying to make. Um, normal traditional growth hackers, again, usually just focus on, on growth. And, and I really like how you mentioned, so when I say growth, growth of profits, right? Um, when you mentioned uh, you know, the depth, I really love that model, right? So understanding, how sticky are users for your product? 
but that's also not the silver bullet. It's not, it's not everything because Facebook has, that, has had that model for a while now. So Facebook really focuses on keeping you sticky. If you, you know, an avid user of Instagram, you're on there every hour. <laughs> um, that does not mean that they are actually trying to better society or the environment with it. And even though they might, uh, in some areas, I'm not, I'm not challenging that, but it's really flipping the paradigm and saying, making it sticky, but also ensuring that the stickiness also benefits the users as well as other beneficiaries or stakeholders within kind of your mix. Hmm. So is it then the case that for you as an ethical growth marketer, it's more important what type of product, what type of company you work with um, than necessarily changing the tools of growth marketing? Because it's really about creating this kind of like momentum and stickiness for a product or a service that actually does deserve it, as opposed to completely changing the tools of ethical or of growth marketing in itself. Um so yes, primarily that is where it starts at. Uh, and we work sometimes with clients that have the intentions, but really haven't translated that into a strategy yet or within their core business offerings. And that's mm -hmm. probably the first step. Um, we, and, and it's probably a bit more radical than saying we, we run sustainable marketing campaigns. And that's purely because we truly believe that, you know, in order for us to transform and shift our system, which is currently a major problem, our capitalistic system is a problem to humanity, full stop. Uh, we need to also understand how internally we can shift our goals and, and metrics of success. Uh, so that is the biggest part of it. But on top of that, it then, you know, when we look at a marketing funnel, and this is uh, for a growth hacker, the marketing funnel is gold, right? It's, it's what you base most strategies on. This funnel defines your user experience. It defines how you can strategically start to create virality within your kind of user experience. And then it also helps you start track and analyze and measure and eventually optimize all your marketing campaigns and all the different touch points for your marketing in general, right? Um, and, and how do we take that forward? So again, I said the, the social impact is the end goal. Usually any growth hacker focuses on an end goal on profitability. And that's usually really good for a traditional business because that means instead of looking at all vanity metrics and, uh, and you know, instead of obsessing over your social media reach and obsessing over your kind of website visitor reach, even though you have no freaking clue who comes to your website, um, it's actually looking at the profit. Now we're taking that one step further and saying, no, profit is just a step towards that social impact, meaning that the focus of not just the growth hacker itself, but everyone within the company and everyone within the growth team then becomes that social impact. So it's really understanding how can we start measuring that social impact and how can we start optimizing towards that. Now that mm -hmm. might mean that profit might take a loss sometimes. Uh, it also might mean that um, you're not gonna measure it extremely you know, in detail at the start, especially at the start of a kind of new business journey or venture journey, uh, but that's totally okay. What we're trying to see is how can we start improving so even if it's fake social impact metrics, it shouldn't you know, put you off, that's fine. There's always a way to start measuring the positive impact and probably the easiest way to look at it is with surveys and, and talking to customers, talking to beneficiaries. That is the simplest form of trying to track that. Um, so that's the, the biggie, if you'd like, after actually saying is the core, are the intentions right? Then it's looking at how can we start setting up measurement and optimization metrics that focus on social and environmental impact. Um, and then thirdly, it's also trying to say, how can we start mitigating risk? So it means, how can we start looking at our funnel, look at the campaigns that we're launching and start to actively think within the team, you know, is there any social or environmental risk that could come with this? And a lot of the times there are a lot. And again, you can't eliminate all of them. But having that awareness within the team is, is a very big kind of contributor to what makes growth hacking ethical, if you'd like. And then finally, I'd say it's, it's, the, it's the culture. Um, we really focus on bringing mindfulness and consciousness within our whole team. We work with our clients to help them become more mindful in their mindful journey. Um, and that just means that they always, whether it's they on a client side or it's us within a kind of executive kind of marketing team, it's trying to always look at the bigger picture and be mindful and cautious from trickling down to, are my employees overworked? 
um, to, you know, again, being more mindful on the, on the risks that can come along with it, to um, being more mindful on, are we actually going the right direction to help, you know, the right people? Or should we maybe do something else and, and change our approach? Mm. I think also you're really touching on something important here. One thing that has come up in almost all of these conversations is how the role of a marketer needs to move back into more of a strategic function within the company where you're really forwarding the, the core purpose of the company as opposed to only serving as an external communications function where you're being told what to say. And I think one really great thing you're pointing to, which has definitely been the case in my experience as well, is that when you define certain metrics, it doesn't only relate to the final outcome of what you're trying to achieve, but it completely shifts the attention within the team, within the company in general, to focus on other things. And I think this is actually one of the most powerful thing about shifting your, your metrics. It's not only how it you know, uh, influences the outcome, but really what it does internally. But what I wonder here, you as a growth marketer at your core, um, I guess the, the kind of stereotype is that you would be incredibly outcome focused and that it's really, as you said, this virality, it's very externally minded in terms of like the, the core business metrics. Um, so do you find that when you try to do ethical growth marketing, that there is still this type of pressure to deliver on your KPIs, even though most of us would associate impact metrics with kind of a longer term horizon? How do you navigate these two things? So um, for me, I'm still, I'm, I'm still outcome focused. Uh, outcome is my core. Uh, it's just trying to understand what is that outcome. And then it goes back again, what are the KPIs that we're even setting? So as part of your impact KPI, which is again, should be the North star of all the KPIs your, your growth marketing function should start you know, working towards. It's understanding how can well-being be part of that KPI? How can, you know, all these other soft metrics that are usually not or have not been in the business space enough, right? Um, how can they be part of your KPI tracking system? And, and so I, I wouldn't say I'm not, impact, I'm not outcome focused. If anything, that is still core at how, uh, how I define myself as an impact marketer. But if, if my team is burning out, that means my KPIs are, are gonna go to trash. Um, if I'm growing profits, but the long-term impactability, if you'd like, isn't progressing. And I, I really want to stress on the term progressing. So if you can't measure your long-term impact right now, it's measuring how you can progress on them and how you can get closer to them. That's still a metric. That's still a KPI, right? Mm -hmm. So if you focus on that and take that continuous learning approach, um, then you can still be outcome focused, but have the right outcome in mind. Mm. So it's really valuing the, the journey. Um, Raluca, I was really curious because you said you have such a vast, uh, you know, time of experience within marketing. How are you relating to the concept of growth hacking? And do you think it has a place in the kind of ethical, sustainable part of, of business? Yeah, so I, uh, I have... I have experience, but it hasn't always been in this area, in the growth part, but regardless of that, I'm actually struggling right now with the um, uh, mental issues that come as a consequence of marketing used unethical. Unethical meaning here that um, the way we are using science and uh, neuroscience actually to manipulate people into buying it's like having the tools to build the to build the atomic bomb but you don't actually do it like you we really have all the tools we need in order to drive behaviors um but i'm struggling with the human um the human um, way of acting in the world let's say into why are we using it in the wrong direction? I mean, why are we just thinking about money and infinite growth and deficit advertising and FOMO driven and everything in between? You know, why are we, aren't we directing it in a sustainable uh, direction where we have the social impact you were mentioning before? Uh, so yeah, I'm trying to, to make sense of how, 
um, we use technology and how we are in a constant development from this perspective and how we use it just to benefit a few or maybe to benefit um, short-term uh, mm. goals, to have short-term goals. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. May, may I maybe just come back to that because I think that sparked a lot in my mind. Um, it's, um, I, I touched on mindfulness and the importance of mindfulness within the culture of having an ethical growth team. Um, and so we constantly talk about, is this manipulative? Um, because if it is, then we're not being mindful. Um, if it's uh, manipulative, it might help us gain quicker results. But again, is it transparent? And if you want to be mindful about you, the way you approach anything, you have to be fully transparent. Um, so what you just said, I mean, mindfulness is, is embedded within psychology and, and neuroscience and uh, you know, the, the origins of marketing, actually there's theories on it, you know, originating from the grandsons of, uh, grandson of, you know, Sigmund Freud and, and taking all the core elements of that, um, and, and applying it on how to manipulate the masses. Um, and so this is something that, especially within the online advertising space is done so well, um, really, really well. And so again, it, the, the fact is how can we be more mindful about that and how can we reduce that risk from the get go? And if the head of growth, the person responsible to run the growth team is constantly pushing on that, I think that's the right step in the right direction. And sadly, that won't happen if the CEO and if the core business kind of departments aren't also on that mindfulness journey, if you'd like. So for me, it really starts with being mindful and looking inward uh, and, and really trying to understand Am I, where are my intentions and how can I make sure to constantly reflect, constantly look at, is this the right thing to do? Am I being manipulative or, or can I be a bit more transparent in the way I approach my comms and my marketing? Hmm. That's actually such a great point. And Heather, just raise your hand. Martin, you'll be up next after that. I just wanted to um, take it a step further, I suppose, and ask well, obviously the tools of growth marketing, some of them are uh, social media uh, platforms and sort of more recently, I've, I've, I've started to not feel that cool about using certain platforms like Facebook, for example, uh, because as you say, they are quite manipulative in the type of content that they show, the way that they try to keep people on their platforms for uh you know more and more time perhaps by showing negative content or um polarizing content things like that and i just wondered are there are there tools that you, as a growth as an ethical growth marketer that you um sort of steer towards using and others that you perhaps don't use so much um yeah i mean this is something that i've been discussing with other marketing leaders a lot um and Ida, I'd love to approach maybe doing a collaborative blog post about this or something, or even get more marketers involved because it is a struggle, right? Um, the biggest social media firms right now are dominating the marketing kind of ad space, if you'd like, and then content publishing space. Sadly, it is the system we live in, um, just like we live in the capitalistic system. So there's, I think, two ways to look at it. Um, let's maybe apply the most ethical, mindful kind of approaches in these maybe somewhat unethical systems that are already in place. Um, but then there's things like, can we try to use Google? And I'm not saying Google is, a good, is the good guy here, um, but at least Google is search-based, right? So, and I'm, I'm talking about online advertising uh, for point of view, right? So it's instead of constantly manipulating by very specific data gathering tools, which Facebook, for example, or other or most social media kind of tools are, are using right now. It's can we try to understand what other platforms there are there that might be a bit better? So starting with Google, but actually the biggest, biggest one to look at is maybe Ecosia. So Ecosia is a search engine that that is, you know, social impact led. Firstly, if you're a social impact business or a sustainable business, it has your target audience probably on there. Um, just so you know, it's in collaboration with, Ming, with Bing. So Microsoft owned, again, not the most ethical in, in all their spheres. 
And there is no strict yes and no answer to this. So that's why you know, I'd love to like explore this further in a, in a longer blog post maybe. Um, but what we try to do is, okay, is there a possibility to start with Bing? So, and focus just on displaying things on Ecosia. Is there a possibility to use search-based advertising? Meaning that we actually display our ads to people that are searching for that specific use or problem or, or solution, right? Um, and then if we go through that, then it's trying to see, okay, what other social media platforms are out there and how can we at least utilize them in the most ethical approach possible and the most transparent approach possible. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's my two cents, I guess, on that. But it's an extremely good point and something, like I said, that no sustainable marketer still has figured out. And it's sadly because we live in this system right now. Yeah, and we are seeing also the first boycotts. I think Lush was one of the very first ones to say, like, we're we're boycotting this. We no longer want to use this platform. And of course, like, to some extent, that will be at their expense as a brand in terms of the reach that they can achieve. And I do really think that as ethical marketers or impact marketers, exactly what you're saying more about transparency is something that sets us apart because when it comes to marketing, it's never only the medium. It's always, of course, also the message. And if you are truly aiming to serve a certain population that you know that you can only reach through, for example, young women on Instagram, let's just use that as an example, then probably the best way to serve them will still be to use that platform. But of course, like what you're, what you're giving them is something that has a genuine intention that serves real value in real time. And that doesn't prey on this attention economy to sort of capture someone's immediate interest. And I think like, this is where we can do such interesting work as a group of people to try to use these platforms in a new way and in that way also show what's possible in another direction. Um, also want to hint that in the chat Maria just put a, a great resource for alternatives to big tech so that's great I'm going to put that in the resource document that we'll be sending out after this. Um, Martin you raised your hand. Yeah Mo I um... I noticed that you, you mentioned uh, sometimes, you know, directors uh, that you want to get on board on this, you know, mindfulness uh, journey towards your goal. It sounded like it might have been speaking from experience there. I know uh, personally, I, I worked in marketing years ago before, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of these terms were even coined. And uh, it was quite difficult to sway uh, particularly superiors. And it does take a lot of courage as a junior member to ruffle some feathers. I'm wondering, in your own experience, how did you bring in these uh, directors or superiors onto this mindfulness journey? This is a, it's a very hard question. Um, just to let you know, my own experience led me to creating my own business <laughs> that focuses on <laughs> marketing. I know, I know it's a hard question, sorry. Um, <laughs> and no, and especially like you said, as someone more junior in a business, it is extremely hard, extremely hard. Um, and I've, I believe that now we're on this you know, kind of mindfulness trend. And um, I think directors are more open to, to hear things like that. I think it's also trying to understand, you know, bottom-up approach really does have effect. So trying to understand what other colleagues you can ally with and, and campaign together on. Um, but like I said, sometimes it is, it is extremely tricky. And uh, I'm just noticing even from recent recruitment kind of phases for our, for our own agency that people are craving marketers especially are craving this um so if they don't change it's actually going to be a big business loss and and risk for big bigger companies or directors that aren't on board with that it is like i said extremely hard though and i really don't have a definite answer to that aside <laughs> of is there a way to collaborate with other colleagues is there a way to come up together and flag this up as a big concern um, because alone it is pretty scary especially if you're a junior member yeah, I've often found myself on the opposite side of communicating on behalf of a company against an NGO. I've actually, uh, don't hold this against me too much, I worked as a communications officer for a lobbying group, an EU lobbying group, uh, representing the automotive industry. And I don't believe any of these people have bad intentions. I believe it is the culture to uh, fight just enough that we don't annoy our members who are trying to slow down transformation, essentially, because, uh, you know, in, in the back pocket, they always reference uh, this many jobs are going to be lost. And that's pretty much the reaction every time 
uh, we have some, you know, negative, you know, criticisms against us. So um, actually changing the messaging, the right amount during the process, we were never going to reach uh, an income of positive message, uh, an out outcome of positive messaging uh, that way, because it's kind of half, half effort, you know? Yeah, um, that was just my own experience. I, I really like what you just mentioned. I think it's also trying to understand how you can meet, you know, meet people halfway, right? Understand their mindset, understand where they're coming from. Um, and there, I mean, I'm a big fan of nonviolent communication, for example, and understanding, you know, what is the need that is unfilled right now for myself? Um, and then looking at their perspective, what is their need that might become unfulfilled if that, if you know, if your way goes through? So it's also understanding that, like I just mentioned, in the future, and it's already happening, um, businesses will lose out and, and directors will lose out financially if they don't do this, if they don't start become more open on shifting the paradigm inside the company and, and trying to be more ethical and be more kind of social impact led. And it is a big journey. It is a long journey, especially for people that have been in this space for a long time and don't know kind of other things. And like you just said, a lot of the times it's, they don't even come with bad intentions. They are thinking about the people, the jobs that, you know, that might get lost in this, but it's flipping them and trying to understand, okay, they're, they're thinking about the business value. Then how can I start with that? How can I actually give them a strong business, you know, value proposition to why we should change in that direction? Um, is that the answer to everything? No. I really truly don't believe that is the answer, just sticking around money because then we go down the greenwashing route. But at the same time, it is it's really an important first step to opening that conversation, to meeting someone halfway and help them understand, you know, I'm not, I don't want to threaten your goals. Uh, it's just more about shifting, you know, certain elements in order so we so both of our you know our needs are met. Um, and that's, like I said, where kind of nonviolent communication, I think, is an extremely beneficial tool. And even there, also, I would add to that to say that, you know, of course, mindfulness is quite a wave. So that in itself might be a language or kind of like a vocabulary that works quite well. But as a social anthropologist, which is my background, I would also say that there's quite some freedom for how you can contextualize what you're talking about or the kind of change you want to see. And some people just have a massive aversion to mindfulness and they feel like it's this wave that they, you know, they just want to oppose themselves to it on some intuitive level, whereas actually, if you can simulate the experience and you can put another vocabulary around it, there is the same resistance. So exactly the point of, on the one hand, understanding the, the motives, but then also understanding the blockers and, and navigating them slightly differently, potentially, um, can always be an option. And I would also just say, I see quite a parallel here between what you're asking and this kind of internal culture and what we're trying to achieve with brands in their industry externally. It's like, if you have a small startup that are truly doing things differently, it's quite amazing what they can achieve to kind of provoke change in the bigger companies in that industry, because merely for watching someone doing it differently, it starts to pose quite a lot of questions. And if you do it only in an internal culture alone, like you're the only one being conscious about yourself and having different types of conversations, then it's exactly what Mo said. Um, you can easily be disregarded in that. But if you're a few, don't underestimate that, that there's quite a lot of symbolic potential in having a small group of people doing things differently. Um, George, you raised your hand. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm just um, thinking that which, what you just said, I, that that's probably a factor of uh, scale that permits to uh, have such a quick type of impact, uh, perhaps. Um, mm -hmm. my, my thought is uh, really, we're all here, I think we're like-minded about this whole concept and how we can uh, uh, attempt to put things in place so that social change is uh, taking place. My, my, uh, I'm captivated by how can we accelerate this change? I'm, because there's, as it was mentioned, there's many hurdles and for large organizations, it's a, I foresee a longer, longer process. I'm trying to try come to grips with how we can accelerate this and thinking perhaps it's a process where we use the environment as a leverage as a leverage point and then trickle to social uh, issues. I'm thinking is that probably one way, you know, an option for, for us to accelerate change in certain organizations? Others might be more socially driven. I'm just thinking that the mix 
perhaps will change depending on the organization. So the hot buttons could be either social, socially driven, environmentally driven, and even uh, economically driven, where profit is not seen as the as the forefront, but more as a tool for you know, additional additional actions. I don't know if I'm being clear, but uh, that's what I'm also thinking. hearing you ask is kind of how can we do growth hacking for growth hacking when it comes to you know making it more um, attractive to actually do this type of work and to have the ethical lens on it. Um, I know yeah. you're doing that a lot more with actually also making sense of this together and in okay. that way accelerating it. So, so George, that is that is our core mission, right? Our, our vision is to accelerate the shift into the new economy by equipping as many social entrepreneurs and ethically minded entrepreneurs with these innovative, disruptive, past toxic, use toxically applied tools um, in order to help them accelerate their impact. And the more social startups that accelerate their personal impact, the more the big people are taking, you know, very careful note of. Um, you know, in, again, the whole kind of shift in consumer trends and consumers prioritizing, you know, brands that are more ethical or that more that are more kind of environmentally conscious. They that alone is driving the conversation up to the boardrooms. And is that enough right now? No, it's not. And I totally agree with you. It's still very slow, and they're built with big systems, and it's extremely rigid. Um, but they're definitely talking about it. And I think there's a, a nice little question, is greenwashing actually productive? Um, trust me, greenwashing is the last thing I would ever say is, is something I'm for, right? Or, or I, I'm championing. But at the same time, if you want to look at it in a more philosophical, I think, point of view, you can see it as a stepping stone, uh, especially now with people become ex becoming extremely conscious about what brands are actually legitimate or are trying to greenwash. And as soon as they find out it's greenwashing, they, be, they boycott, they become extremely adversely kind of, you know, their, their relationship and really breaks up with that specific brand. So I, I believe it's showing by example and equipping and championing these, these newer companies uh, or these companies that are maybe older, but are already kind of up to speed on the new kind of, you know, road to a purpose-driven, ethically aligned business. Um, it's championing them, it's talking about them, it's supporting them, it's deciding like we did with Zebra Growth only to work with them, uh, even though there's space for other people to work when changing the bigger organizations. But we, I, I truly believe that it's currently extremely needed to bridge that knowledge gap um, where most social and ethical entrepreneurs feel like, you know, it's, it's toxic world, you know, the world of innovation, startups, disruptiveness, growth hacking is all toxic to their ears. So they don't even listen. Uh, the problem with that is that they, they fall behind. <laughs> and once they fall behind, it means that they can't actually lead by example. Um, but alone that shift is putting a lot more investment in this space, right? Uh, a lot more bigger organizations that are maybe not as ethically rooted still are now kind of investing in newer ventures that are. And the more that that happens, the more that this, you know, the more likely the system is going to accelerate. Mm -hmm. mm. I want to really dig into the tools with you because, you know, you want to build this bridge and I'm sure there's plenty to share, um, but we have some raised hands as well. Heather, what were your thoughts? I was, um, I was just going to back up what you said there, Mo, and um, something that we talked about two weeks ago was about the companies that go out there on a limb and do things first. So companies like um, uh, Tony's Chocoloni, for example, who's tackling um, the issue of slavery in, um, in chocolate produ cocoa production and actually you know, supporting those companies that are willing to put themselves out there. Yes, they're coming in for a bit of criticism because they're not perhaps as squeaky clean as they could be, but they, they're doing a hell of a lot more than any of the other companies. And it's, though, it's, um, it's getting behind those kind of first movers. So yeah, whether that's Tony Chocoloni, whether that's uh, Patagonia in the outdoor wear sector, whether that's um, uh, who gives a crap in the um, you know, toilet paper um, domain. <laughs> and, um, and so, so yeah, it just, just to back up what you said about actually really supporting those ethical companies, those companies with a purpose. And, and, but I think most specifically those first movers, because they're the ones that are making other companies sit up and take notice and be like, okay, well, 
yeah, maybe we need to look at our practices too because we're we're losing market share to these guys. Exactly, because they're shifting the expectations from yeah. everyone in that industry and in the market. So, Mo, um, tell me or tell us, what are your top three marketing practices that we should all be be moving toward or using to create better change for the better? Um, yeah, sure. So I'll, is it okay if I share my screen? I don't know if I can. Oh, yes. Wait one second. This is a first for our sessions. We love a trendsetter. Um, I think, strangely not. Uh, Marcello, can you try quickly if you're able to? Um, well, I get to, I'll get started. Well, yes, there you I'm, go. Yes. Awesome. You should be able to now. Um, cool. Uh, what I'll share is just a random document we have internally. So please don't read too much on it. Um, but I'd like to introduce the, the ethical growth funnel um, taken from growth hacking, uh, which consists of your usual funnel of awareness, acquisition, and maybe you know revenue, which is usually what a, in a digital marketing context has been used for a while. Um, this one focuses on you know really trying to focus on retaining people and then referring people, generating the revenue in order to make that impact. Uh, and this is where placing your impact as your core North Star KPI is really um, kind of seen in practice, right? So this funnel uh, encourages people to, to share your content, encourages people to share your brand um, with the end goal leading to an increase in social or environmental impact. Um, this is the funnel that we use for almost every marketing strategy that we create. Sometimes we flip around the referral and revenue kind of section. Um, the impact is usually referring to the long-term impact, but again, we try to see how we can start measuring at least progress in the short term for that, that will lead towards, you know, the long-term impact. Um, but this funnel, look it up, we're in, we're in a kind of normal growth hacking context, it's called the pirate funnel, or the R funnel. Uh, that's why it's called the pirate funnel, because it sounds like a pirate, R, not because it's trying to be mean or steal anything <laughs> um but like i said it's then saying okay how can we use that effective extremely effective tool that most silicon valley tech scale ups are using these days and then add that really shifting little step at the end and focus on that impact now once you try to understand and define key metrics for each of this funnel stage so try to understand how can i start calculating the awareness that we're creating how can I start you know, analyzing or measuring the acquisition that happened? And this is not acquisition necessarily with acquiring a new paid user, but it's usually acquiring a new brand fan, if you'd like, right? Uh, someone, so this could also look like your newsletter sign up. Um, then it's looking at how can we retain them and actually engage them and keep their, you know, their interest in what we're doing and educate them right, in the impact that we're doing. Then it's trying to understand how can we strategically incentivize them to share our brand, our story, our content, our free trial version of our product, whatever it may be, um, to then strategically try to incentivize them to buy uh, that then leads into that impact and start measuring that impact that then feeds into, again, the education, awareness, and acquisition stage. So this is a, probably the golden, golden framework that I would recommend anyone to check out. Like I said, it's called the pirate funnel or the growth hacking funnel. Um, but please make sure to add that impact element at the end and stress it within your team. Really, really stress that that's the end goal. Um, another maybe, so I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, another maybe very practical tip is just the way you approach your marketing in general, right? So when you write a marketing plan, again, the biggest differentiator is a growth hacker, a growth marketer throws their assumptions out the window. Um, it doesn't mean that your experience, your existing data isn't relevant. Utilize that, create your baseline, understand where you're at currently, but then don't assume that you know the future because we don't. And anyone trying to tell you they do is lying to themselves. So instead of assuming what will happen in six months, what the best channel is in six months, what the best messaging is in six months, um, what the best, I don't know, product iteration is in six months. Try to take, you know, a scientist lab approach, if you'd like to it and say, what can I as a marketing manager, including my whole team, 
my junior designer, my head of product, my production assistant, how can we set up a system to really start to experiment with our hypotheses or come up with hypotheses that will really leverage the biggest, you know, biggest dials, if you'd like, to help us progress where we want to get to. So how we do this practically is we actually set up monthly uh, experiment meetings, right? This is in a, in a usual context. Sometimes you can do it every two weeks. Sometimes you can do it every four weeks. Sometimes you can do it every six weeks. That's what's referred as to a growth cycle. And what the objective of that growth cycle is, is to validate or disprove your highest prioritized experiments or hypotheses that you come up with as a team, right? And how do you prove that? It's trying to understand once you define that experiment that you feel has the biggest potential to increase your impact, it's then trying to understand, okay, what is the minimal viable kind of version of that I can create to validate that using real life data? And when I say real life data, I mean, it could be picking up the phone and asking your clients. It could be setting up Zoom meetings uh, and it could be running an advertising and split testing two different landing pages with totally different approaches, right? Um, that's, that's, I think, the two biggest uh, maybe tools I'd like to share today. And I think that if you try to adopt this more, um, it could really, really, in the long term, leap your kind of impactful driven growth, right? Uh, the, the most important thing within those two is to trust the process. So again, taking a scientist approach in it. Second week of this first growth cycle is going to feel awkward as heck. <laughs> it's going to feel weird. We're just doing this one small experiment. We don't know where we're going towards. But if you really trust that cycle, the, the process, sorry, if you trust saying we will analyze that data after a month or after six weeks, we will see which ones are working. And the, the hypothesis that got validated the most, that's where we put more investment, more money, more energy into and repeat that cycle and test out something totally new because you know, maybe there's a whole new platform that launches in a month. Maybe uh, consumer trends change extremely in a month. Maybe social needs change in that month as well. So it's again, taking that, we're, we have a direction for this month, then let's analyze, let's scrap everything we're assuming, let's regroup and you know, brainstorm as a team collectively, and let's start that cycle again. Um, so how we create marketing strategies is by, like I said, looking at that funnel, looking at your purpose, trying to understand what impact you're actually wanting to create. Then it's trying to understand what are the foundational baseline, you know, analysis that we can make and assumptions that we really have some solid foundational data to back off. And then what is the process? So really focus on half of our strategies are just process oriented. So what meetings need to take place, whether that's daily standups, whether it's weekly um, sprint meetings, um, whether it's monthly sprint cycle meetings and retrospectives and trying to reflect and analyze the data that's been collected and then making another brainstorming session to say, okay, we've got 10 new ideas within the team. Which ones can we prioritize now to test out next month based on which ones are, are potentially going to create the biggest impact? So Mo, I'm sure a lot of us are so on board with this because, you know, we've probably seen months and months and months of marketing strategy work that then increasingly becomes irrelevant as you go. And it's this very stressful kind of inefficient process. So if we assume that we all say, yeah, okay, we want to move into the growth mindset. Uh, we know that impact counts, ready for it. What would you say then? in your experience have actually been the the most common pitfalls for startups that want to adopt this type of approach so i think i, I hinted on that at the start it's not trusting the process right uh, especially the first few cycles that you do it becomes you you can become jittery and that's again where mindfulness comes in place you have to learn to let go uh, you have to learn to be in the moment you have to learn to, to trust, really trust the process and make sure that the whole team trusts that process as well. So what I see a lot of the times is someone wants to attempt that, does plans their first experiment. And after the second week, they're already making an assumption what will happen in three months and they start launching a big campaign and kind of get sidetracked. Um, now, it might not feel as efficient the first two, three weeks, but trust me, if you do a few cycles, the amount of knowledge and insights that you as a team can learn and gain is going to be revolutionary. 
Um, the second thing I see people do is really, you know, test things that don't matter. Test things that huge corporations are testing. And that's maybe what they read in a blog post once. You should split test your title. So you should create a landing page and split test. Should we use word A or word B? Um, that might be great if you have five years of data backed up and you've already kind of explored what the biggest levers are. But what I like to say is try to first focus on the core things. So within your marketing department, as your marketing leader or growth lead, try to say, okay, what is the, and this is where the strategy comes in place. Instead of saying, we're going to launch this campaign, this campaign, this campaign, we say in the first few months, these are our focus areas. Um, and in the first month, I usually go down to what's your value proposition? Because the value proposition is probably going to be the biggest determinant, determinant of, of your success of marketing. And trying to understand how can we experiment with first your value proposition to understand have we nailed that at the minute are our customers really resonating with that and can we collect some data to back that up secondly it's then looking at your virality effect so your virality effect as i showed in that funnel before comes before your revenue meaning that people are going to start sharing your brand your experience your newsletter whatever that product is, what are the offering is, whatever that value is that you're giving them before they purchase, they're sharing that and basically bringing more people into the funnel for free, right? So if you focus on and crack that one core virality loop, you know, approach, whether that's an incentive that you try to experiment with, which incentive resonates most with our users, or it's, um, Usually it's an incentive, but sometimes it's even tools you can build, right? So which tool can I build on my website that will help to refer people? Once you've cracked that, then you start looking at your channels and your target personas. And only at the very end, do you look at your finer messaging? Um, because the value proposition is your core messaging, right? But the finer detail on whether we should use word A or word B in the specific ad or in a specific landing page, that comes at the very, very end. That's like minuscule ways to improve and optimize. What I'd also like to say and how to avoid kind of getting sidetracked on like experimenting on the wrong things is use that funnel, right? What I showed before the different funnel stages, try to understand how we can measure it. How can we have one metric only per funnel stage that gives us a higher level perspective on how successful each that stage is? And then you can try to understand what is our conversion rates per funnel stage. After you've done this quite a bit, you'll have a pretty good you know, set of data and pretty good insight on which two channel parts or which conversion rates are you're losing out on. And that's can at, you know, after the core few cycles, after you've been through your virality loop and your value proposition, um, that's when you can say, okay, I'm gonna look at my funnel and my data now and try to understand which of my conversion rates are most my you know most users or potential customers flowing out on? And can we then experiment, have the focus of our next cycle, of our next experimental cycle, be on you know, just improving that specific user journey from step A to step B or from step C to step D? Mm -hmm. So I think I think those are the biggest pitfalls. Um, and those are maybe, yeah common ways on how you can maybe avoid them and, and try to combat them. Let me challenge you on one thing more. Um, a lot Please. of the startups we work with, they don't only want to market to a market that exists and a mindset that already is in place, but rather they actually want to use their voice and their thought leadership and their you know brand to drive actual change. And one thing I would assume running purely experimental a purely experimental strategy is that what you're doing is you're you're operating your entire strategy and your methods based on what works currently in the market so how do you balance that of actually having an, an intention for the change you want to create as well as wanting to launch something that grows right now in the market as it stands so um i i definitely agree with you and there's also sometimes sometimes things like SEO, which you can't test uh, that fast, right? Um, and sometimes you need longer time periods. And there, uh, and there is different scenarios. So this is a kind of basic framework that sometimes needs to get adopted and, and changed as based on the scenario. Um, there, what I'd like to say is how can you split on split up the long term and the more short term? 
So how can you say we're going to have this long term strategy of change because it's core to our business model, it's core to our theory of change um, that we need to that will require, you know, six plus months time. Even there, I try to see, is there any way we can track improvement on there in the short term? And if so, let's try to use those metrics. Um, but then making sure that not all your efforts is run there and you run that in parallel with the shorter term. And the reason I'm saying that is because, you know, the, if you actually bring momentum to your movement, that's where in the long term your movement can actually become beneficial. Um, the, the big problem is sometimes, you know, marketers within the space say it will take three years to change mindsets. And so we need to wait out three years. Um, but that means they haven't caught momentum. Um, and if you build your funnel based on what I just showed you before, it, it means that you can actually build that momentum and drive your longer term, you know, theory of change as well. So maybe not a definite uh, white and black answer there, uh, like a zebra, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, there's there's definitely ways you can do that in parallel. Um, so we we sometimes within our strategy sometimes have these like foundational long term marketing and comms activities, and then have a layer of growth marketing on top. Mm, that's awesome. And actually, thank you everyone in the chat who's sharing lots of interesting articles and case studies. We're going to add them to our resource list that we have for every session. You're going to get it over email and along with the recording as well. So you can always check that out and kind of dig into it more. And obviously you should check out Zebra Growth because more you and your team are doing such amazing things. Um, we're already at time. That went by very fast. I think yeah, the, the main thing I take away from the session definitely is really the value of metrics and the value of processes and how that in itself can create a lot of results just by focusing your efforts and making sure that you're truly learning at every step. And I mean, I can just say I know from experience how tempting it is to have the long, long, long strategy processes. And it's not just the case that when you work with startups, you need to see it differently, but actually the world is changing so fast that it is sort of a condition of the world we're in to have this approach. So Mo, thank you so much for bringing startups up to speed, for sharing your wisdom with us. And thank you everyone for sharing your perspective as always. It's really awesome to hear your thoughts. Um, next week, we're gonna bring in a brand. Actually, we have quite a few on the table to kind of get the inside story from, from a brand manager. But we're also curious if you have any requests for any particular brands you would like us to explore or get someone in from there to kind of discuss what they really did. If you do, you can send us an email, drop it in the chat, or even maybe you have someone in your network that you want us to invite. We would love to do that. This is very much for you. Um, and yeah, keep an eye on your inbox. We're gonna send the resource list. We're gonna send the recording. You can always check back. And what I would really, really appreciate if you have the time for 30 seconds right now, to offer us a tiny bit of feedback um, should be quick just to give your impression of the session and how we can improve it. And of course, the conversation does not end here. So if you want to add more on LinkedIn, add me on LinkedIn, you know, continue this, then please, please do. We love to hear from you and keep things going. And of course, if you're not already uh, on the recurring meeting invite for every Thursday, here it is. So have an amazing Thursday, everyone. And thank you so much for joining. It was great. Thank you, everyone. Thanks very much. Thank, thank you, Mom. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.